I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker is Greg Woods. Greg's program is going to highlight the growth, the growing focus on Alzheimer's and dementia in public health, including what causes memory loss, what the latest research shows in our fight against these conditions, what can be done to decrease one's risk, what resources exist locally, and what the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services is doing to help. Greg works as the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia Program Coordinator for the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services, which was formerly known as the Iowa Department of Public Health. Prior to that, he was a program specialist and research spokesperson with the Alzheimer's Association of Iowa. Greg earned his um, a BA in Neuroscience from Drake University and a Master's in Public Health from the University of Iowa. Um, I'm glad to see you all here. I think each of us has um, been touched in some way by a loved one, a family member, or even con are concerned about our own health. Uh, it's a very uh, topic that touches us all, and um, we're great, grateful to Greg that he's come from Des Moines to be with us tonight. Um, join me in welcoming Greg. Thank you all for having me here. I noticed that our screens are a little bit red, so let me turn off the nightlight. Should we shut because, off the nope, nope, there we go. Here. And we usually dim the light. That's much better. <laughs> there we go. Is that, uh, oh, yeah. Is that yeah, that'll be perfect. All right. Good, good. Well, no, that's all right. You're not missing much. It's all right. Uh, well, thank you all for having me here today. I really appreciate uh, whenever people uh, come out for a program like this because this is an important topic. And it's one that not everybody likes to always hear about or talk about. So I want to come at it from a couple of different angles to try to get around that a little bit. So this program I created a couple of years ago. Uh, as she said, I am the program coordinator for, we shortened it to the ABRD program, because it gets to be a mouthful if you say it the whole way every time. Uh, basically, I am the ABRD program, and myself and my supervisor at the moment, so we're a very small team, uh, but we try to be mighty. We try to rely on partners and people all across the state who are doing things in the Alzheimer's and dementia and senior related realm. And we are trying to connect the dots and make sure that people can either get their questions answered or find out what resources are available to them. That's just one thing that we're going to talk about tonight, though. So ideally, what I'd like us to be able to do by the end of this program is to be able to know what a general idea of dementia and Alzheimer's is. What is the difference? What are the similarities? Is there a difference? We'll talk about that. Uh, also, where we have been and where we are, and perhaps where we are going with our understanding of this disease. We mentioned research just a little bit ago. That's a, an area that I really, really love. And there's so much coming up through the pipeline that uh, I, I think it's always good to highlight something like that. Also, how do we know if we're going to get this disease? What are the risk factors, the things that are going to tip the scales one way or the other in our individual risk for getting it in our lifetime. Why do we care about this? What is the scope of this epidemic? How widespread is this? Also, why do we care in terms of how it affects our communities? You know, I'll, I'll say at the beginning here that for a long time, Alzheimer's was not considered a public health issue. So hopefully by the end of this program, you'll begin to appreciate, well, it, hopefully you think it kind of is. And I'll explain why that is. And finally, why public health should play a role in trying to do some of the things that I've described. So to begin, I always think it's good to take a step back and do a couple of definitions. Because traditionally, we haven't always been the best at using the right terminology. Science, in general, hasn't been. So that's led to a lot of confusion and a lot of ambiguity for what we're talking about with these diseases. So when we talk about a dementia, you can think of that as an umbrella term. You know, something that is broad and overarching for a lot of different types of conditions that affect the brain. Now, underneath that umbrella, you have multiple things, but dementia is that broad overarching. It's not just memory. You know, we normally think of these diseases only as memory, but it's other parts of the brain as well. Our ability to think, our ability to socialize, our ability to do the daily tasks that we do. Also, one thing that is common among a lot of dementias is that they are progressive, meaning they get worse over time. We'll talk about why this is important and how this is specifically in Alzheimer's disease. But I also want to talk about 
this line right here. Interfere with daily life. From a diagnostic criteria, when we look at what is or is not a dementia, that's a big one. There can be things that interfere every once in a while with memory, but that does not clear that hurdle of becoming a dementia. It has to interfere with daily life. We'll talk about what does and doesn't constitute that also moving forward. So when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's is under that umbrella of dementia. So in other words, every case of Alzheimer's is a case of dementia, but not every case of dementia is necessarily Alzheimer's. There can be other types too. There can be frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body, Pick's disease, mixed dementia, vascular dementia, there's pseudo-dementias. There's all kinds of different things that fall under that umbrella. But Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. So to illustrate what happens here, I've taken a cross-section of the brain. So if you're not familiar with this, imagine that the brain is looking directly at you and we've gone whack side to side. So you're seeing a cross-section of two brains here. Now the one on the left, that is a normal, healthy brain. You can see that it's pretty rounded, it's pretty supple, it's got these little wrinkles that squish together, it's got these small little spaces in the middle, hangs down a little ways. It looks pretty normal. There's a differentiation between this outer dark layer and the inner lighter layer. So if you've ever heard the term gray matter or white matter, by the way, that is actually a thing. Uh, if, if you ever, I, I would say if, if you ever find yourself dissecting a brain, <laughs> if you ever look up, perhaps, uh, somebody dissecting a brain, you will actually see that there is a difference in gray matter versus white matter, and that has to do with what part of the brain cells are in what area. So that is actually a thing. And in a healthy brain, normally there's a really clear border between those. Now on the right here is a brain that is affected by Alzheimer's disease. And one of the first things you notice about it is there's just less brain there. It's smaller. You know, those, those supple, squished wrinkles are now big valleys. The little spaces in the middle that normally act like shock absorbers for the brain are now huge. They're puffed out. And it doesn't really show it here, but that gray matter and white matter distinction, it gets really blurred. It's not clear like it normally is. So why does this happen? And how does it relate to what we think of as Alzheimer's disease? Well, as you now know, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It doesn't just deal with memory loss. However, you notice these areas down here that are very open compared to the brain on the left. This is an area that's known as the hippocampus. I'm not going to quiz you on the names, but that's just because it looks like a seahorse. But that is the region where our memories are held, is in the hippocampus. And coincidentally, that is one of the first areas affected by Alzheimer's disease. So when we say affected, what exactly do we mean? Well, Alzheimer's in general is one of those progressive brain diseases, one of those progressive dementias that gets worse over time. Because it affects those memory centers first, memory is affected early on. But because it's progressive, it moves on to other things as well. All of the things that the brain controls, it has different places in it that control those things. So there's an area for your eyesight. There's an area for language. There's an area for just about everything that your body does to keep itself alive. And over time, this disease will march on to those different areas. So it affects thinking, ability to carry out basic functions, even keeping yourself alive. Now what's interesting about this, these early changes, and, and you'll, you'll hear me talk about a few of these, these windows that research could step into, is this is a big one. Brain changes can begin before the onset of symptoms. Research finds that some of those brain changes, some of the things that you may see happening up here, could start up to 20 years before the onset of symptoms. So that is a huge window that research can try to step in and say, could we stop that before it gets on to the symptoms? Now thankfully there's a lot of research that is currently looking into that window. How can we get the brain back onto the normal track if it's started to stray from it? But one of the challenges is, how do we know if we're not looking for it? 
So that's a big one. You'll hear me talk about a few of these windows over the course of this program. So now that we know a little of what Alzheimer's is, I think it's good to talk about how we got to our understanding of today. Now if you go back, let's say a century, probably don't even have to go back that far, there were a lot of differences in what was considered elderly back then compared to what we think of now. Back then, if a person lived long enough, well, people was kind of accepted, uh, they're probably going to get senile, they're going to get hardening of the arteries, you know, they're going to get all these things that eventually we're just going to have to ship them off to a home, you know, put them in the sanitarium or whatever it might be. That was considered elderly at the time, that memory loss, the paranoia, the changes in thinking, the ability to do the activities of daily life. I want to introduce this fellow here. Anybody know who this is? Now, I will say I've heard uh, President Taft. That's, that's not, that is not President Taft. Um, I, I've, heard, I've heard a couple of other presidents as well. Uh, but any ideas who this is? Dr. Alzheimer. Yes, that is Dr. Albus Alzheimer. He was a physician in Germany in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And he saw a variety of patients including what we now know of as one of the first identified patients with this disease. He had somebody come to him who exhibited all of the signs and symptoms of being an old person. But the problem was she wasn't old. She was in her 40s. So Dr. Alzheimer at this time in 1906 said, there's something going on here. If she can show the signs and symptoms of being old but she's not old, Maybe the signs and symptoms of being old is not actually that. Maybe it's a separate disease that not everybody gets. So when this woman, who was named August Dieter, died a couple years later, a colleague of Dr. Alzheimer sent him microscope slides of some of her brain tissue. And when he looked at it, he saw some of what we now know of as the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. He found what we call plaques and tangles. We still use this terminology to this day to describe what you see in the brain. But the problem was, this was in the early 1900s, so we couldn't do much with that information. There weren't good ways to look at the brain, especially in a living person, if you need microscope slides of their brain tissue. So for the most part, we just kind of stayed there. There were a lot of interesting papers that were published in the early 1900s, and he did not want to call Alzheimer's disease originally, but then they said no did kind of do this and figure it out. So he was one of the team that helped to figure out what we think of as Alzheimer's disease to this day. So what does this look like, these plaques and tangles? Well, on the left here is an image of brain cells. So the brain is entirely made up of brain cells, and I often think of them kind of like trees. They've got a bunch of branches that stick out in all directions. They've got a trunk, and then they have roots that stick out in the other direction. That's the general shape of brain cells. If you try to find a good one, maybe down here. So this is the trunk that I talked about, and then up here are all these roots, and then down here is all the branches. And all of those brain cells are tangled together, sending signals from brain cell to brain cell to brain cell. So when you used to have to call the opposite coast and have to be routed from switchboard to switchboard, that's basically how thoughts move through the brain, from brain cell to brain cell to brain cell. But this big blob in the middle is not normal. And that is one of the things that Dr. Alzheimer saw. This is what's known as the plaques. <laughs> this is made of a protein called amyloid. And it sits in between the brain cells and stops them from being able to signal back and forth to each other. So this fairly healthy brain cell down here in the bottom left, over time, begins to look more like this. It loses the branches it loses the roots. It stops functioning, and eventually it dies. Now you can't really see it here too well, but inside of the brain cells, you also get buildup. And that's what we think of as the tau tangles. So tau is a different kind of protein, and it builds up inside the brain cells and just gunks them up. You know, it's been a long time, I, I, I kind of forgot that I did this, but I, I liken it to if you ever have uh, a, a hood open on a car, you know, and the engine's running, the belts are spinning and everything, you just take like an extension cord or something and throw it into the engine compartment, it's probably not going to like that very much. 
that's kind of what those internal plaques do to the brain cells. It, it gunks them up, it stops them from being able to work. So they die. And you lose those connections. And because the brain is made of the very thing that is dying, that's why the brain shrinks. Because it's losing its material. So that's what Dr. Alzheimer posited, that we have plaques and tangles that are involved in some way in this disease. But even today, we don't totally know how. What we do know, however, is that this is a very complex thing in individuals, in humans, who are also very complex. So we've changed our understanding of aging as a whole in the 100 plus years since Dr. Alzheimer, thankfully. So what we now know of cognitive aging is this is a normal process. This is something that the brain will do as we get older. It's going to change a little bit. Just like we age, just like maybe we get some more wrinkles or we get some more gray hairs, our brain is going to go through some aging-related changes too. But these are very mild compared to what we think of in Alzheimer's and dementia. So you do have some benefits of cognitive aging. You know, they talk about an increase in wisdom and expertise, you hope. But on the flip side of that, sometimes it takes a little bit to remember something. Maybe a name slips your mind for a little while, or you have to go, okay, hold on, is it? Monday? Is it Tuesday? Oh, God, I think it's Monday. That happens. You think of the classic, where did I set my keys? I've lost them again. That happens. That happens to just about everybody. The difference is here, is that when that word slips your mind, when that name escapes you, at some point, you're probably going to go, ow, that was it. I just thought of it. And even if you don't, it happens. Maybe it's once in a blue moon. Maybe it's a little bit more often than that. But remember on that early slide when I talked about that phrase that's very diagnostic? Interferes with daily life. That's a difference. This kind of forgetfulness stuff, that's normal aging. That little slowdown, that occasional forgetfulness. We now understand that kind of taking that next step, maybe there are some memory issues, but it is getting noticeable that it's happening a bit more often. This could be something that we've now identified that's called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. The reason why I put this up here, the reason why this is important, is here's another one of those research windows, like I mentioned earlier. So MCI is this kind of in-between stage, where it's not normal aging, it's not bad enough to be Alzheimer's or dementia, but there's still something going on. We've got to figure out what it is. The reason why this is a research window is because people who are diagnosed with MCI are more likely to go on to develop Alzheimer's and dementia than those who do not get diagnosed with MCI. So if we could step in at this point and try to fix the MCI before it progresses on to something else, that would be preventing cases of dementia. The good thing with this is, sometimes there are causes of MCI that are not related to Alzheimer's. Simple things, relatively, like vitamin deficiencies, or mental health issues, stress, infections, on and on and on. There's all kinds of things that can make a person's brain a little cloudy for a while. And those are all reversible. So it's really important, whatever memory changes that a person may be noticing, either in themselves or a loved one, to try and get it checked out, because Best case scenario, it might be a relatively simple fix. Now that's not going to be for everybody, but not everybody who gets MCI is going to go on to Alzheimer's either. You just don't know. So we always, in public health, we always deal with risk. And that can be kind of frustrating because people want to know, yes or no, am I going to get this? I really wish we could say 100%, you will not. 100%, yep, you probably will. The best that we can do is weigh uh, you're more likely or you're less likely. And there are things that we can do to tip those scales. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, brief overview. Now you know there is a difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. Dementia is that umbrella term that Alzheimer's falls under. It's the most common form of dementia. And it is a progressive disease that tends to start in the memory center, but spreads from there. 
There can also be a lot of other types of dementia. Ryan with Alzheimer's and like a Parkinson's dementia or vascular dementia or things that are exacerbated by outside conditions or chronic conditions that a person has. But no matter how you look at this, all of the things that we're talking about here are not a normal part of the aging process. Separate from cognitive aging is Alzheimer's and dementia. The reason why we know this, remember back to that patient that Dr. Alzheimer had. She presented when she was in her 40s. Now we know that is something that's called younger onset Alzheimer's. And what we mean by that is it's something that affects people under the age of 65. 65 is kind of that magic cutoff number that for whatever reason, above that age, risk begins to go up quite a bit. Below that, you still can get younger onset, but it's very rare. It's something like two or three tenths of a percent of most new cases end up being younger onset. But they have their own set of complications as well. All right, so now that we've talked a lot about what this kind of is, how do we get it? What are the risk factors? What are those things that can tip the scales? Well, despite what I said about it is not a normal part of aging, age is the number one risk factor. Now, this may seem a little paradoxical, but like I said, the older a person gets, the higher their risk gets. It's never a guarantee. You get people that are 105 years old that just have minds like steel traps, that can happen. But the older a person gets, the higher their risk gets. Past that age of 65, every five years, a person's risk doubles. 65 every five years doubles. Five years doubles. So it does keep going up. Past age 80, what that means is that one in three older adults is going to have some touch of this disease. It may not be full blown, it may not be really bad, but it still could be there. Number two risk factor is <coughs> genetics, our DNA, our family history. What we know of is that people who have more close relatives who have Alzheimer's disease, their risk is going to be higher than somebody who does not have any of it in their family at all. The emphasis there is close family members. So I'm not talking about third cousin twice removed or the roommate of a second aunt or something. I'm talking about siblings, parents, maybe parents and grandparents. If it's close to that person, their risk is going to be higher. But on the flip side, if it's maybe a parent or a grandparent, one of them who had it when she was 95 and started getting dementia, that's probably not going to change the risk all that much. So genes and age, two things that we would love to change sometimes, but we cannot. No matter how much we'd love to stop aging or change our family, we can't. But what we can do are some of these other things. Lifestyle is a big one. Especially within the last 10 years, there has been so much research looking into the things that we can do to help our brain health. Lifestyle is a big one. Education is a really interesting one. And what I don't mean by this is how high a degree do you have? That is not what research is looking at. What research is looking at is are you keeping your brain active? Are you learning new things? Are you using it? Are you sitting in an environment like this, learning something? If you are, you're getting brownie points, that's good. It helps your risk, it lowers your risk. And there's a lot of other things that play into this as well. Now even outside of that, there are some differences that we can't always account for. Two thirds of all cases of Alzheimer's are in women. We don't totally know why that is. Even when you control for women having a longer lifespan than men in the United States, there's still a difference. When you look at all kinds of different health issues, there is still a difference. And this difference exists at birth. What we know is that every one in 11 men, when they are born, will get Alzheimer's in their lifetime right now. For women, that number is one in nine. That's before you throw in any of those other risk factors. So there is automatically a difference, and we have to try to figure out what that is. Most of the research that was done in the 1900s up through, I don't know, late 1900s, was mostly in men. There wasn't a lot being done in women. So we're trying to play catch up with that. 
And thankfully, the last 10 years especially, they have really tried to focus on all kinds of actually really cool studies to figure out why this is. Another difference is there are some races that have higher incidences than others. So African Americans, for instance, are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's in their lifetime as Caucasians are. For Hispanics in the Latino population, that's one and a half times more likely. And again, this is before all of the other risk factors that we talk about in a person's life. That research that I talked about in the early 1900s, that was mostly done in men, but it was mostly done in white men. So here's a big subset of the population that we're now trying to understand. Why is it different? If we can understand why women and why some of these different races have different levels of risk, that could help us in our understanding of this disease as a whole. And on top of that, these are populations that are already less likely to receive a diagnosis, or if they do, they receive it later in the disease process. So Alzheimer's is farther along, it's progressed more, so that means higher costs, it means a more difficult situation, and there's all kinds of different social determinants of health and reasons for that. But we have to try to understand this. So knowing all this, what can we do? Whatever our risk factor may or may not be. Well, two absolutely shocking ones are gonna be diet and exercise. <laughs> This kind of makes sense, I suppose, because what is good for your body is gonna be good for your brain. The two are kind of linked. So what's gonna help one is going to help the other. If you think about what all the brain needs when it operates, it needs oxygen, it needs blood flow, it needs nutrients, and that's the kind of stuff that we take in, that we breathe in, that our heart has to pump. It's our day-to-day -day stuff, it's diet and exercise. And I'm not talking about major shifts either little changes here and there we found can actually decrease a person's risk in each of these categories by about 10 to 20 percent depending on which studies you're looking at another area keeping your brain sharp you know I get asked a lot about uh, the, the brain teasers and Sudoku and, and crosswords and things like that and they say does that help is that beneficial for my brain and the answer is it depends if it is challenging to you then yes it is helping if it's second nature to you, if you can do those things really easy and it's not really that much work, your brain's probably not being exercised all that much. It's just like going to the gym where you're picking up the lightest barbell a couple times. No, you gotta push it out of its comfort zone. So if it is a challenge, then yes, it does help. Another really interesting area of research is staying social, the benefit that that has. This may not be obvious on the face of it, but what, what I like to think about is what goes into a social interaction. Now, let's say somebody comes up to you and they start talking to you. Think about what your brain has to do in that moment when you're listening to them. Okay, you've identified them, they're telling you a story, you're thinking, okay, why are they telling me this? Is it to entertain me? Is it to teach me something? Is it to ask me something? Oh, am I acknowledging back to them? Am I giving them nonverbals? Do I have anything to add? If I do, when is a good time to jump in? On and on and on. And we just do that on the fly. We don't think about all those steps. It's just something that we do. But for a brain that's affected by Alzheimer's or dementia, that begins to get a lot to handle. So staying social is a good workout for many parts of your brain. Just like diet and exercise, a couple of others that are sometimes easier said than done is managing stress and getting good sleep. We all struggle with it time to time, or maybe all the time. But so much research looking into not only why do we sleep, but how does that affect Alzheimer's and dementia? Is it kind of a chicken and the egg thing? Is decreased sleep coming because of Alzheimer's and dementia? Or is Alzheimer's and dementia coming because we haven't gotten great sleep? There's all kinds of lines of thinking in there. There's actually some research going on down at the University of Iowa into that very thing right now. Stress, whole body effects that stress has. You know, if you've seen those pictures of, of the presidents from when they come into office versus when they leave, <laughs> they've aged a lot more usually than just four or eight years. That is because stress can really affect everything. Metabolism, sleep, mood, your quality of skin and gray hair and all of these different things. So managing stress is a big one. When we talk about some of these things, what we are looking at is 
increasing cardiovascular health. So things that are related to the heart and the lungs. Now obviously diet is a big one. Diet is the nutrients that we take in that helps to feed all of that stuff. So little things here and there can add up and make a difference there. Also, stuff like smoking can have a huge impact on the ability to get oxygen to the brain because the lungs that are damaged can't get that oxygen transfer in and carbon dioxide out. But the good thing is we now know that stopping smoking, even within a short amount of time, can actually get lung function starting to come back a little bit. It can increase oxygenation. It can increase the metabolism in the brain. Different diets we have been studying for a long time sometimes, what, 30, 40 years? I don't know how far back Mediterranean diet goes, but longer than that. And over time, it just keeps reaffirming that this stuff is good for our heart. And now we've learned it's also good for our brain. So DASH diet, which is for high blood pressure, Mediterranean diet, which we've, we've all heard about, and then the MIND diet, which is kind of a combination of two of those. Now, physical activity is also another big one that affects the heart. And affects the lungs. But when we talk about changing these things, I'm not asking you to completely go to the Mediterranean diet or to start running a marathon. Research has found that just little changes, even walking a few extra minutes per day, or switching out one of those sweets for maybe something a little bit healthier or not going back for seconds, little things can begin to add up. It's that whole journey of a thousand miles, starting with a single step. Same thing with mental activity and staying social. We're not saying go out and learn a brand new language. If you like playing games, maybe try a different game that you're not quite as good at, that you're not as familiar with the rules. You know, if, if it's Sudoku or something, go up to the next level of hardness on that. It makes you think a little more. Sometimes, if you can combine several of these things, you'll get out and volunteer. You're getting new experiences, you're staying social. Sometimes that gets you out and moving, so that's kind of a benefit as well all kinds of different things that you can double up on. And in the end, what they found is that if you try to make changes in those areas, diet, exercise, staying sharp, and staying social, you can decrease your risk for Alzheimer's by 60%. <clears throat> That's not a trivial number. Normally, you know, a good study is maybe 10, 15%, but 60% is huge. That's actually enough to offset if somebody has a family history of Alzheimer's, and put them level with somebody who doesn't. That's big. So why do we talk about this? Why are we focusing on the details of this disease? Well, I'm going to ask you a question then. This will be a true or a false. You can abstain, but... All right, true or false. Alzheimer's is one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Now, there's several things to take in here. First off, is it a cause of death? Second, is it in the top 10? All right, so one of the top 10 leading causes of death. Anybody for true? Well, I'm gonna feel, oh, I've got delayed, all right. All right, anybody for false then? Okay, we're gonna mix, that's, that's a good mix. Couple of things to unpack with this one. Ultimately, the answer is true. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States in a non-COVID year. And why we say that leading cause of death, and a cause of death in general, gets back to that idea of the brain being destroyed. So remember I said that there were different parts of the brain that specialize in certain things? Well, if those areas are destroyed, the brain can't do them anymore. And some of those areas are things like <coughs> breathing, swallowing, digestion of food, regulation of body temperature. These are things that may not in and of themselves be the one cause of death, but they are ultimately all contributing to it. What this looks like numbers-wise is around six million adults here in the US have Alzheimer's disease. And there's a new one every 65 seconds. So if you think about just in the time that we've been here, that's a lot. When I first got started with the Alzheimer's Association, what, seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, this number was something like every 68 seconds. Then after a couple years, it dropped down to 67, and 66, and 65. If we continue on the path that we are right now, by 2050, that 6 million will be almost 14 million. 
and that 65 seconds will be once every 33 seconds. So the, oh, yeah. is that just demographics? Because we have so many more people getting older. Partly, yes. Yeah, partly it is because of the age distribution in the U.S. Right now, we are entering this window where the baby boomer generation is clearing that 65 hurdle, and then the risk starts going up. And it's going to continue for a while like that. And you can see how this changes as the population ages. So 1 in 10 over the age of 65 becomes 1 in 3 over the age of 85. Now this is a mix of also people are living longer, so part of that is a contribution, but also we're understanding this disease and the different shades of it, if you will. Here in Iowa, we see similar trajectories, but obviously with some smaller numbers. We have about 66,000 Iowans who have this disease. And we have over 70,000 Iowans with what we call subjective cognitive decline. You don't have to worry about that too much. I'm just saying these are memory changes in general. So people that are noticing memory changes that aren't Alzheimer's disease, 70,000. So you begin to get an appreciation of just how widespread this actually is. And if you think about the distribution geographically of Iowa, we have a lot of rural areas. But of all the doctors in the state, just 38% of primary care physicians, so your family doctor basically, are located in rural areas. So we begin to see this disparity. Uh, there are services out there, but a lot of times they're in more urban centers. There are only six specific memory care clinics here in Iowa. When you look at all of our neighboring states, that is the lowest by far. I think Wisconsin has something like 40. And we have six. And they are all in urban areas. If you want to look at the number of Iowans versus how many physicians we have, I thought this was just kind of an interesting breakdown that we did. There are around 1,200 Iowans for every one family doctor in the state. Now obviously not every doctor sees 1,200 patients, but Breaking it down that way, that's a lot of people. But that's family doctors. If you want to get specialized for the brain, for neurologists, that number goes up over 5,000 Iowans for every one neurologist that we have. For geriatricians that focus on older adults, now you're over 15,000 to one. We don't have that many. And unfortunately, this is not something that is super easy to change in the short term. But it's something that a lot of people are working on, and it's kind of something that we're going to try to work on as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So now that we know there are a lot of Iowans that have it, there's a lot of people in the U.S. that has it, this puts quite a burden on the healthcare system and our communities as a whole. I won't go into all of these numbers, but put simply, Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in the U.S., again, in a non-COVID year, because this is a progressive disease. It affects people and they're gonna need more help the longer they go. It is already very costly from the get-go in terms of at-home care, assisted living, full care. And you can see some of these costs, out-of-pocket costs, around $200 billion. Medicare, on and on. This affects a lot of different aspects of our community. This one, especially being financial. All right. Another throw it back to you for a question here. This is a multiple choice. What percentage of Alzheimer's care in the US is provided by unpaid caregivers? So I'm not talking about the nurses, I'm not talking about people who work as this is their job. Is it 23%, 43%, 63%, or 83%? Unpaid caregivers. All right, anybody for A? Nobody for the low end. What about B, 43%? Anybody for 63? Oh, we tempted a few on that one. Okay. All right, what about 83? Oh, we're going on the high end. <sighs> Wish I had better news, but unfortunately it is 83%. 83% of all care for Alzheimer's and dementia in the U.S. is provided by unpaid caregivers. I didn't understand why this was. But one of the biggest reasons is, contrary to what you might think, 70% of people with Alzheimer's disease still live in the community. 70%. So it's not this disease of, well, we'll just send you off to a care facility. 
In practice, it doesn't work like that, especially here in Iowa, where there may not be a care facility that can take that loved one. So that falls back onto the caregivers. Alzheimer's, there are 16 million caregivers. That is a heck of a lot. And the care that they provide is costly and voluminous. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot out of them as well. But 70% living in the community is often contrary to what a lot of people think. They just think, well, if they get bad enough, then off they go. But no. This is in the community, and it's in most communities as well. So who are these caregivers? Well, much like the people with the disease, two-thirds of all caregivers are women as well. Over That's half surprising them, when more women have Alzheimer's. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Over half of them are still currently working and providing care at the same time. And a subset of those are in what we call a sandwich generation, where they're taking care of parents, or elderly relatives, and children, too. Half of them, half of that 16 million, have been doing it for almost four years or more. So what's the, what's the percentage of people providing care who have an illness themselves that's so related to devoting so much care to uh, patients? It is very high. It is very high. Uh, oftentimes what we know is that the people who are caregivers end up with higher medical costs themselves. They tend to have a much higher risk for chronic conditions, and they have more out-of-pocket care costs, more hospital visits, more emergency room visits for themselves. And we also see 60% of them say, I'm very stressed. 30 to 40% actually suffer from clinical depression because of that as well. Yeah? I spent some time in life insurance business, and at one time there was a product that was sold for a couple, and it uh, served the second to die. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We had to get rid of the product because the second to die, the wow. healthy one always died first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that is absolutely true. It often gives a much higher burden of physical, psychological, social, financial, on and on. And caregivers are often ones who don't really seek the care themselves, and, and part of that is just altruism on their part. They don't want to take away from their caregiving. But this affects them also for those that are working. It affects the work, too. I know I've talked to people who run companies, and they often say, well, I, I guess I don't really think that that many of our workers are affected by this. But the numbers say something different. They just may not share it all that much. I mean, look at the total who have had to take time off to care for a loved one, or had to step down from full-time to part-time, or they turned down a promotion because they thought, this could interfere with my ability to provide care. And then you have a different subset of one in six workers quit entirely because they just can't sustain that full-time job and be a caregiver as well. So hopefully now you're beginning to see why I believe that this is a public health issue. It's not just a medical or an older adult issue. It affects so many different aspects of our communities, from the workplace, like we just saw, to the people who are still in the community, to community services. So this is where we can try to step in and help on some of these things. Thankfully, the tide is turning. More people are seeing aging and dementia as a public health issue than we ever have before. So when I think about what's kind of the bread and butter of public health, I think of surveillance and monitoring, so keeping your finger on the pulse of how's the community doing? Are there more cases out there? Are there people that need help? Risk reduction is a huge one. Public health does not treat the patient. Public health tries to prevent that from ever being a patient. They try to prevent the community from getting there. So risk reduction, we now know that plays a huge part in Alzheimer's and dementia and the outcome. Early detection and diagnosis, remember those windows. If we can detect this progressive disease earlier and more accurately, you have more chances to treat it than if you wait until it progresses to a very severe, untreatable state. Also, safety and quality of care. We talked about the people who are in the communities, well, both them and the people who are in the care facilities. We need to make sure that our understanding of this disease is informing 
the type of care that they receive? Have we studied up on what medications are good for them and what medications are not great for people with dementia? Do we know what types of communication strategies are more effective when you're trying to talk to somebody who is farther along in this disease? So these are all types of things that public health in different forms does every single day with all kinds of other topics. So why not dementia? It just fits. And thankfully, we are starting to see, even here in Iowa, the response to this. Something called dementia-friendly communities. We have a good handful of them that have started more in the eastern part of the state. Uh, it's starting a little bit north. Charles City is one that is uh, up in the northern part of the state. But most of them have started kind of in the Iowa City corridor, Waterloo Cedar Rapids down to Iowa City. And they're starting to work their way west. These are communities that have said, all right, we hear you saying that every aspect of our town is affected by this. What can we do? Can we make our transportation more accessible? Can we make the signage clearer? Can we make getting in and out of stores better? Can we make people who often deal with those who have this disease informed of how to recognize it, how to talk to these people, how to see if something is off and try to help them? You know, the, the bankers, are they prepared if somebody comes in and has written the same check several times in a row? Do they know what to do and who to turn to? So they have poured their whole communities into this, and they are trying to get other communities to do the same. It's a slow march, but we're getting there. People are recognizing it. We also were created as part of this, so I, I am happy that, uh, that, that this exists because that tide slowly turning toward public health is partly why this program came about. So a few years ago, there was a piece of legislation that was passed here in the US called the BOLD Act. It stands for Building Our Largest Dementia Infrastructure. Weird acronym, but BOLD said all of the states that want to improve your dementia infrastructure, we want to help you do that. So Iowa was one of the states that applied and got funded for initially three years here to try to make some changes to our infrastructure, to try to connect partners, to build resources. So we are in a partnership with the CDC's Healthy Brain Initiative, and we're in year three of it right now. What we have done over the course of this is we first tried to figure out, all right, what resources currently exist? What's out there in Iowa? And that is not very easy. There are a lot of places that are doing work on this that don't talk to any of the others. So they don't know what else is out there. We also wanted to understand how are we doing from a numbers standpoint before we even dive into this. So working with the University of Iowa, we, we created a landscape assessment. So this was one of our earliest documents. You can tell because it still has IDPH on it instead of Iowa HHS. Uh, but this is a great document that tells us how are we doing here in the state with some of these numbers. How are we doing with access? What are some low-hanging fruit things that we can try to change that would be fairly easy that would make a difference? So we used this document to take our early steps toward our next overarching goal, which is the coalition. One of our main purposes for existing is to create a strategic plan for Alzheimer's here in Iowa. So using the information in the landscape assessment, we got people from all over the state, over 50 people who are experts or have lived experience or who are caregivers or who have some different connection to older adults or Alzheimer's, to come together for about a year and a half, we worked on figuring out a state plan. And thankfully, I wish I had printed copies, but I don't yet, it now exists. This is online, and you can use this QR code or just go to our website as well. And you can read the state plan that was put together by this group. So it breaks it down into four main areas that we can make recommendations for. So educate and empower the public, develop, I should say, policy and mobilize partnerships, assure a competent workforce, and then monitor and evaluate how we're doing. Those are the four broad areas that the Healthy Brain Initiative wanted us to develop recommendations for, and we have. So we're trying to get that plan out there. So if you want to come up afterward and scan that code or get something with our website on it, I'll put it up on the screen as well. Please do it because we want to get that out there. We want to hear your opinions because this is a document that we want to evolve and grow over time. What we also want to do in the meantime is just general other stuff. We want to increase messaging and awareness, get people to care about this disease, kind of like programs here. 
We want to decrease preventable hospitalizations, increase the number of people who talk to their doctor, not just about Alzheimer's, but memory concerns in general. We want to get people using that free Medicare wellness visit that should include a cognitive screen. So if you're kind of on the fence about you know, getting the brain checked out, that Medicare wellness visit should have some component of a cognitive screening that could at least give you a baseline to refer back to years down the road. Really helpful. So in terms of other resources that are out there, remember I said we're pretty small, we do have some good partners that cover all of the state. One of those is the Area Agency on Aging. There's six of them scattered around Iowa. They cover every single county, and they are so good with knowing what is in each area and knowing who to turn somebody to, to, toward to talk to. The Alzheimer's Association is another one. They are a nationwide nonprofit. There is the Iowa chapter that is here. They have volunteers kind of scattered throughout the state, but they also have a lot online. They have support groups, both for the caregiver and the person who may be in the early stage of the disease. They have those fundraising walks, but they also have what's called the Community Resource Finder, where you can type in your zip code and see by distance what is nearest to you, wherever you may live. They also have one thing that I absolutely highly recommend, probably above all of these, is a free helpline. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have specialists who are staffing this helpline that you can call them and say, my loved one for the first time doesn't recognize me. What do I do? Or, you know, they probably need to stop driving at some point. How do I have that conversation? Can you walk me through it? Sometimes they can just be an ear to listen. But that helpline is so important. I'll put that number up here in just a little bit. The Department on Aging is another one that's coming under the umbrella of Iowa HHS fairly soon, but they've got a lot of good information on their website too, and sometimes they do outreach in different parts of the state as well. You know, I mentioned support groups, caregiver, early stage, but they also have things that people with the disease can go out and do for fun. Dementia choirs tap into that whole idea that music is really stirring to the brain. Sometimes you'll find places that have those, or maybe they'll do a one-off. Memory cafes are activities that you can go out and do painting or sculpting or something with others and get that social aspect in, but still give that loved one an outing, something to do. Also, a big area that we are trying to work on is respite care. This idea that you can take your loved one somewhere for a day or for an afternoon, and the caregiver can take care of themselves or run errands or do whatever they need to do. Unfortunately, these are very few and far between. So we're trying to change that. We're trying to get more of that available. Sometimes long-term care uh, places will, or assisted living will allow you to do this, but that's also pretty rare as well. But they are out there. We also have a lot on our website. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but some of this is up here on this front table when we're done. Stuff that you can either take or you can order uh, for free, and we'll send it out to you to help spread the word, get posters up, if you want more information on things. We've got a lot that is up there. One last thing before we go is I'd like to pass this around. This is just a, a quick little survey. If you want to take it, you don't have to, uh, but if you want to, it helps us to understand how we're doing with our reach. You don't have to put your name on it, but if you do want more information, we're happy to contact you and, and go through that. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all for coming out for this. Uh, I know there's probably questions or things that you'd like to cover a little bit more, but up here is contact information. We also have our website, the Alzheimer's Association website. Here is that helpline. So if you want to copy one thing down from this presentation, that's a good one. Uh, and then the CDC's page about aging as well. So thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I will open it up for questions. Uh, yeah. <coughs> What is the, you said the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, what does the DASH diet involve for the Mediterranean, or can you Google Mediterranean or DASH? Yep, you or can. Any other words? You can, or you can also talk to a doctor about it, but, but the DASH diet is very specific for foods that will help to lower blood pressure. So it's more cognizant of sodium intake and salts and different things, cholesterol levels, um, just, just little 
frameworks for what should or should not be eaten. Very similar to, to some of the other diet plans that sometimes people are on, but DASH diet has been around a long time, so yeah, there is information out there about it. Um, the MIND diet, kind of the same thing, it's newer, but a little bit different. Uh, and then Mediterranean diet, yeah, it's been But if you were to Google those words, um, would they know what you, you're looking for? Yeah, yep, yep, it, it should. Yep, so just, just look up DASH diet or Mediterranean diet, and there's a lot of good information out there about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How does the, how does the United States compare to the rest of the world in terms of the people of America? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question uh, about how does the U.S. compare to the rest of the world. There are different places in the world that do better than the United States for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, if you've ever heard of like blue zones, you know, where, where there's these areas of the world that people just tend to live longer, there are similar areas when it comes to dementia. Uh, some of the blue zones are some of those areas, but not always. And where it gets interesting with the research is that sometimes you get people who have transplanted from one to the other, and it, it doesn't always make sense, the outcome. So let's say somebody is from one of those areas and they come here to the US, you think, well, they're probably not gonna do as well over here, but they do. And vice versa, somebody that transplants to one of those areas, sometimes they do well, sometimes they don't, with risk. So there's a lot of areas to be researched there. I think of, uh, for cancer research, that there are you know, terrific places that are universally acknowledged, like Sloan Kettering or Dana Farber, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there one place in the United States that is above all the rest in terms of Alzheimer's research and publications? And you know, I, I don't know that there's one clear one, but there's a handful that come to, to mind that I've, I've dealt with before. Mayo has a really good uh, research center up there and the treatment center. Um, Johns Hopkins is another one. Uh, University of New York is, is what they call a center of excellence that's tied in with the BOLD Act that, that we do stuff with. Um, Minnesota as well, uh, University of Minnesota, they have a center of excellence up there that's about uh, uh, caregiving, dementia caregiving. So it's kind of a handful. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is actually the world's largest nonprofit funder of research. Uh, so they are just US based but they fund research in, I think the last that I saw was something like 120 countries around the world. So they are a really big one. Um, they actually have a big international research conference every year that I've been fortunate enough to go to, and it is just mind blowing. Like there are, there's 3,000 researchers that come from all around the world, and I didn't know how much I didn't know that I didn't know when I went there. It was just so many. Be more of a clearinghouse then. Oh man, it, it, is, it is just amazing. All of the different lines of research and thinking, and you know, we, we, I heard somebody mention AI earlier, they're looking into that, they're looking into machine learning, they're looking into all kinds of different therapies, both medication and not, ties in with autism, and I mean, just on and on and on. There's so much fascinating research that we say the sun never sets on Alzheimer's research right now. And most of that is because the Alzheimer's Association is funding a lot of them. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah. So with death caused by Alzheimer's, is it as various, like for example, the different organs that cancer will attack? I mean, is it is there one usual type of death that comes with Alzheimer's, or is it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It, there really isn't. Uh, if, if you think about how complex the brain is, it, it would kind of make sense that something that's affecting it isn't always very simple. So a lot of times it's a contributing factor more so than the actual direct one. So we think about, you know, if it's affecting a person's ability to swallow, for instance, if they have something happen to them, aspiration or pneumonia or things like that, that's going to be the primary cause, but Alzheimer's played a part in that. So the term that we use is, is universally fatal is the disease. So one way or another, in other words, uh, that's, that's what it's considered. Any, yeah? Can you speak to diagnosis? I know there's the outward signs, but earlier in your presentation, you showed a picture of the healthy brain and another x-rays, CAT scan, is yeah. that used? Yeah, so that's a good question about the different ways that we can image it. We've come a long way in that. It used to be the only way that you could get a 100% diagnosis was take a piece of the brain after the person died. That's not very helpful for the living person. So now we have come a lot farther than that. They have different types of PET scans that actually look for those proteins that build up in the brain. Those are not super widely used for just initial diagnosis, but it's used as kind of like a contributing, oh, that's a clue that we have. There are different cognitive screenings that a doctor will be able to do that's kind of like a series of questions that can say, yeah, this person probably has it. 
and then they'll look at things like the scans or they sometimes do a lumbar puncture, so the, the, the fluid that circulates between the brain and down the spinal cord, that can actually have some of these proteins, these biomarkers in it. And that's more common over in Europe to be diagnostic, but here they still sometimes do that. Uh, and then there's a few other different types of imaging that you can do as well. There's one that's specific for the tau, there's one that's specific for the amyloid, there's ones that look at function. You don't really have a before picture because most people don't get their brain scanned when they're healthy. So if you just see a snapshot, you don't really know, has it gotten worse, has it stayed the same? So after that it can be helpful, but yeah, normally they, they do the fact finding and kind of the information gathering to really build up that, that confidence level before they'll do some of the other things. They'll, they'll rule out other causes before they get into that. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm? Are there any good drugs that people can take for Yeah, so, so good question with the medications. There are a few Alzheimer's specific medications that have been on the market for quite a while, but all of those only deal with the symptoms of the disease. So what I mean by that is when we show the picture of the brains, the, the difference in them, that process of shrinking the brain and it being affected is still going to march on while that person's taking the drug, but their symptoms are not going to seem like it. Their symptoms are going to seem fairly normal. The problem there is because the brain is complex like we talked about before, you can never really predict how well those medications are going to help with symptoms. You know, if it's, if it's this downward progression, sometimes you might plateau and that plateau might go out for a while before picking up or it might just be a little blip. For some people, they may not have any experience at all, but others, it really may help. Now, the difference in the last couple of years, though, is we had two drugs that have come on the market that claim <laughs> to slow down that disease process. One of them is pretty controversial, and I'm not entirely convinced that it's going to hold up. The other one is, has a bit more promise to it. So the first one's called aducanumab, or, or the, the common name is aducanumab. There were some oddities with the numbers on that one, and they weren't really sure if it worked, but they said, well, we're going to approve it, but you need to give us more data. A lot of doctors aren't, aren't doing that one. Uh, the more recent one is, I believe it's called, the, the, the common name is Lakembi, or, or uh, Lakanumab. These are antibodies, which are kind of like getting our immune system going, that target that protein in the brain. And the idea being, if it can clear out that protein that's gunking up the brain, will that help with the symptoms? And the early research says it might. So that one just came on the market this last year. Uh, still a lot of data to collect with it, but we're hopeful that it will show promise. The good thing is, on the other side of that, there are, I want to say last I looked, like 200 and some medications and therapies that are currently in the different clinical trial phases that are trying to get to the market. Now very few of them will actually make it, but even if we get one or two, that would be huge. So. Those are the, the, the long answer to that, the, the short answer is, there's not a ton of medications out there for it, no. There's a few that help with the symptoms of the disease. There might be one or two that are brand new that could help with the disease process, but ultimately they don't reverse it, they don't stop it, they might slow it down a little bit. But it's part of the process of getting to eventually a cure or a reversal or something down the road. Yeah? We talked a lot tonight about Alzheimer's. What if, is it important to make a distinction between a person having generalized dementia and Alzheimer's, or how do you know, and why is it, you know, people raise that question a lot, it seems, and I don't know that, that it's significant. Is it significant? It depends on where you are in the disease. So for most dementias, if it's really late in the disease process, no, like you said, there's not a huge difference in, in what you can do to treat it. But for people who are early on or even in the middle stages, there are different treatment options depending on what type of dementia the person has. So when we talk about you know, doing those tests and the scans to try to figure out what a person has, you will actually see different types of buildup in something like Lewy body dementia versus Alzheimer's. The, the, the buildup, the plaques, the Lewy bodies are different than the amyloid and the tau. Same thing with, with Parkinson's. That's going to affect a very different part of the brain than generalized Alzheimer's in the memory centers. So depending on what you see, that can influence treatment. So vascular dementia is going to be treated differently. Um, frontotemporal is going to have a whole different set of and symptoms. And that can be well. determined. Yes. Those can all be determined. Yes. But not every doctor is going to. So that's something that we're trying to change a bit. Because some doctors will just say, you've got dementia. And they'll just stop there. But we really want to push people to advocate and say, no, no, no. 
find out what it is. Like take those next steps, try to get that referral or try to get those scans because it can make a difference. Somebody who has frontotemporal dementia is not gonna have the memory loss, but they're gonna have very different behaviors and it's going to affect their life in a very different way than somebody with Alzheimer's and at a different pace too. So a lot of times you will hear people say, yeah, they were only diagnosed with dementia. That's very common. But that's not satisfactory. No, it, it shouldn't be. For, for some people it might be, but ultimately if you want to have some different treatment options or if you even want to know a better understanding of what could be coming, try to figure out, try to push them to take those next steps and say, no, 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 let's, let's pin this down. Thank you. Yeah. Can Parkinson's and dementia somehow be related? Yes, that is a good question. Parkinson's and dementia. We think they are related in some ways. Uh, you can get what's called Parkinson's dementia, where it has that kind of general fogginess and it affects the memory. So normally Parkinson's, what we think of is, is a movement disorder. And, and that's because of where it affects in the brain. It, it basically destroys the stop mechanism for movement. So whenever we try to stop a movement, there's a part of our brain that says, oh, stop. But Parkinson's, it loses that ability. So the movement continues. But that's in a very specific part of the brain. It's called the substantia nigra, which is very different than the hippocampus where the memories are held. But for whatever reason, and there's, there's theories about this that was in the research conference and others, they think maybe inflammation could be tied in with when they, when they bridge each other, you know, when one affects the other or when one makes the other one worse. Inflammation is one side of things. They wonder about blood flow. Uh, there, there are several different lines of thinking for why they can talk to each other. They don't always. It's, it's never a guarantee. Uh, but sometimes one can affect the other. Yes. We just don't know why. <laughs> yeah. What is the vascular that you were talking about? Yeah, vascular dementia. Yeah, so that's a different type of dementia that when they look at it in the, in the scans, you can actually see a different pattern that is tied in more closely with the blood vessels. So there's several different things that happen there. But the ultimate effect is a dementia-like state where it affects the thinking because the brain cells and some of those areas are affected, but in a different way. So instead of the plaques and tangles building up in Alzheimer's, there's damage that still leads to the loss of brain cells, but it's a different mechanism to get there, and it's tied in with blood flow, they think. Does that have, is that the frontal area? Sometimes it can be, but, but it's sometimes general. Sometimes it's, it's more specific. It, it depends on where they catch it. So like other dementias, it's progressive. So the thinking is it could start in one area and then get worse over time. The only one that really is very specific, or I, I shouldn't say the only one, there's several that are specific, but certainly Alzheimer's, we talk about the memory center, frontotemporal being literally front part of the brain, so personality. Uh, those are two that are very specific with where they start. Lewy body, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, those can be in different areas. If you want to prevent Alzheimer's, is it healthy to get a puppy? <laughs> you know, just in case this is a loaded That's question, uh, I'm going to say it'll depend on your life situation. <laughs> Exercise. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Did you have a question, by the way? You don't, you don't have to get a brain scan, no. Um, a lot of times we, we don't recommend that because insurance is not going to cover it if you just randomly say, hey, I'd like to get a brain scan just to have that baseline. Obviously, it'd be great because then you could refer back to it. But functionally, no. Most places are not going to do that, so it's pretty hard to, to convince a place to do it. If, if you've got loads of money that you want to burn through anyway, then by all means. But there, there's several other things that are kind of like that in dementia. Sometimes people ask about, well, you said you know, DNA. Are there genetic tests that can tell you if you have Alzheimer's disease? And some places will try to make it sound like there are, but there really aren't. You know, there are genes that we know that are tied in with Alzheimer's, but they're not what we call deterministic genes. So, you know, sometimes you think of like breast cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2, that if you have it, you're going to get breast cancer. Alzheimer's isn't like that. You know, there are genes that can influence and, and increase your risk. So even if you go out and do a genetic test and you have those genes, you still don't know if you're going to get it, unfortunately. So there's things like that that I wish I wish there were. There's there's a lot of different research looking into a blood test. There's there's an interesting one that looks at the eye, at the blood flow in the back of the eyeball. Can that?
figure out are you at risk for Alzheimer's? There's a smell test that they're trying to develop that, you know, if your smell changes past a certain point, is that an early symptom of Alzheimer's because of how close smell is tied with memory? So hopefully we have more answers to that in the near future, things you can do now that are going to pay off down the road for referencing back to, but ultimately most places aren't going to do that for you. Does banging your head all the time affect some of that? I mean, you know, every now and then you whack your head. Yeah. You, know, you walk into the, the car door. I mean, I'm seriously, I mean, yeah. it, does that? So, so that has been a hot area of research, especially with all like, the NFL stuff and the, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the CTE that they have. What we now know is that there is a link between concussions and risk for dementia, but it has to be more repeated. It has to be more frequent. If it's just once or twice, or if it's, you know, as a kid it happened, or, you know, few and far between, your risk is probably not going to be that much higher. But certainly if it was a traumatic brain injury, so pretty, pretty substantial, that will increase risk. Uh, things like strokes and, and other things, those can also increase risks. But unless you're moonlighting as a boxer or you know playing football without a helmet, your risk is probably not going to be that much higher unless you have a lot of concussions over time. Well, I'll stick around. I know we're a little bit past time. I'll stick around if any of you have any more questions. But come on up and grab some stuff up here for resources. And if you ever need anything, feel free to get in touch, and uh, we'll try to point you in the right direction. So thank you very much.